Welcome to another episode of Experience Focus Leaders Podcast. I am delighted uh, to welcome Kyle Poyer. He's an operating partner at OpenView, which is a venture capital firm where Kyle helps portfolio companies fuel growth and become market leader. He specializes in monetization, as in pricing, product-led growth, and SaaS metrics. He also runs Growth Unhinged, a weekly Substack newsletter with over 30,000 readers. And Kyle is really, in my view, one of the true go-to-market experts on something we call product-led growth, something we uh, are very passionate about and relate to. And I think, quite frankly, a lot of the world is getting uh, excited about this way of engaging with software and digital products. So Kyle, tell us a little bit about what product-led growth is and more importantly, what it's not. Um, so that uh, our audience that's not as familiar with all the B2B lingo that you and I live in, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get in, in, into the topic a, a little bit uh, faster. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, so it's it's actually an interesting story. Product-led growth is a term coined by a colleague of mine at OpenView, a colleague Blake Bartlett. And what we were noticing was that there used to be a, an old playbook for how companies grew, how specifically software companies grew. And that was, you know, hire armies of SDRs or BDRs. They would, uh, you know, cold email, cold call into decision makers. And then they would hopefully create opportunities for the sales team. You know, maybe marketing could generate some of those opportunities as well. Uh, but, you know, generate opportunities and then get to the decision maker and navigate demos and procurement and legal and, and so many, so many stakeholders. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we're looking at fairly, fairly long deal cycles and a long lag between when the conversations happen and then when end users ever get to touch a product. And when we looked at, you know, portfolio companies, uh, many of them struggle to grow uh, in a in a profitable way with that model because you're constantly behind the the curve around hiring. Uh, you have to hire a lot of people to make these motions work and scale, and you're either not hiring fast enough to support the growth targets, or you're hiring too fast relative to the demand environment, and then you're sort of you have too many people on the team, right? So it's just uh, a constant game of uh, of catch up. And what we started to see is that there were companies uh, like Atlassian or in our portfolio companies like Expensify and Datadog that were taking a different approach. And they were saying, hey, look, we're going to go after that end user rather than just the executive. We're going to open up access and let them try the product and, and see value and then advocate, right? Go to their boss to try to uh, you know, explain why the, the organization, organization should buy. And it really flipped this notion of how to grow a software company on its head. And at the time, there were a lot of different terms that people use. So we would hear it as consumerization of IT, mm -hmm. B to C to B. Uh, some people called it shadow IT, right? Because these were right. tools that weren't officially sanctioned by the CIO. Uh, but there, there was no consistent playbook for how to grow these kinds of companies. Uh, and in many cases, VCs were actually skeptical about these companies' ability to grow because they didn't have a clear plan to spend money to make money, right? This uh, this went really against the curve of, of traditional uh, SaaS growth. And we looked at it and we said, these companies are actually able to grow faster as they scale. They drive a really fantastic customer experience. Uh, they can run experiments to kind of make that experiment experience better and better and better. And they're just less reliant on hiring people because they're, there's an opportunity to hire people um, mm -hmm. in sales or customer success or other roles to accelerate growth, but that's not required for any growth, right? Uh, and so we we just started getting really excited about these businesses. And so that hence, you know, creating a, this kind of category of company around product-led growth and a set of frameworks and best practices and the you know the summary to to people uh, with all of this work is to think about product led growth is taking things that would normally done by people and finding automated productized experiences and pointing those towards helping you acquire convert and retain your customer base 
And so just about any software company can take elements of PLG to reduce friction and, and uh, you know, bring productized solutions into their business. But then there's, of course, companies that are, you know, totally uh, bought in and they take this to, you know, the, the they're on the leading edge of product led practices and they apply PLG to every part of the funnel, right? They'll have a and, and, and uh, tell us like what are those all, all sets. Right. So this is this is great. So like what are the extreme PLG companies and what are the hybrid models? And I think we, you know, because uh, obviously um I think there's a difference between lending uh into, for example, an account, building relationship, building champions for the PLG motion. And then still, you know, in the global 2000 organization, sometimes that's the world that we live in. There's still processes for something to become a serious platform that are, you know, you're required to go from, you know, compliance approvals and so on and budgeting. And so guide us a little bit on, you know, where does the extreme PLG work and, and where does it stop working? And also even on growth, right, we definitely see a pattern that even the companies that start out was a PLG, eventually once they uh, hit a certain level of size, um, start hiring sales teams. Maybe they operate a little bit differently. Maybe they're not called sales; they're called somebody else. But like they, you know, there's this sort of hybrid motion that's emerging as well in a number of companies. And I think a lot of there's a lot of confusion as to what is, you know, what's one versus the other. What what would what would be your advice on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, first off, PLG for folks listening, PLG is not anti-sales. Uh, mm -hmm. Every at scale PLG company has a fairly sizable sales team. And that's not, you know, some sort of flaw in PLG. Uh, it's so just wanted to like get that, uh, that out there. But, it, you know, in my mind, so some of the leading edge PLG companies, you might look at Calendly as an example, mm -hmm. they're one of our portfolio companies. And so what, what makes Calendly interesting from a PLG standpoint is that, uh, End users can sign up for Calendly for an everyday problem that they face in their workflow. Right? They hate the back and forth of scheduling. So a sales rep has that problem, a recruiter has that problem, but mm -hmm. an executive, a consultant, a lot of people have this have this problem. So you sign up for Calendly, you integrate your calendar relatively easily, and you start sharing your Calendly link with other people. Uh, you find a lot of value relatively quickly through all of this time savings. And then you ultimately oftentimes buy Calendly because you can put it on a credit card. You can often expense it. It's about $10 per month for that initial purchase, which is relatively reasonable for a knowledge worker given yeah. the amount of time that Calendly can help save folks. Uh, and then there's, so it's PLG in Calendly's case from like a initial entry acquisition standpoint and even from a conversion standpoint, and then there's an expansion motion where uh, and if the expansion happens two ways. One is that you realize, hey, look, I'm a sales rep, but I want to bring in my BDR into a meeting. I want to bring in my customer success person. I want to bring in someone else on the team. You can start to schedule group meetings with Calendly and you start kind of going viral within your organization where Calendly is instead of just a single player mode product in a company, it's all of a sudden used in multiplayer mode. And so you have teams using Calendly in a larger company. So it starts to expand its footprint in an organization. And you notice that uh, Calendly is a product that'd be really boring if you were the only one who used it, right? You want to send your Calendly link to someone else and they start to see, oh, wow, this is kind of an interesting product. Well, I'm scheduling a meeting with someone else. Should I just use Calendly myself? And so they sign up for Calendly, start using it, right, to schedule their own meetings. And so Calendly can expand inside of an account, but then it also has a virality component that attracts new users who then sign up and kind of go through this flywheel. And so Calendly has, you know, PLG elements that support a lot of the pillars of growth, uh, but they still have a sales team. And uh, that sales team is important for enterprise deals that have, you know, more stakeholders involved, uh, that have kind of deeper use cases for Calendly, and they're often working with people that already know the brand, already love using Calendly, right. and that can help advocate from the bottom up and help Calendly get to that de that decision maker. Well, first of all, congratulations on, on the wonderful investment. We do see Calendly quite a lot in, in our universe it relates to. And one of the things that we've started um, advocating to our clients is actually embedding Calendly 
for example, inside a presentation, which is historically you just see it more as a, hey, here's an, an email link, uh, which is really viral and people put it in their signatures, which is you know, a fantastic uh, application. And, and we started seeing, well, what if you know, we put it inside key assets in our website or uh, so that the ebook or some other collateral directly gets you to the subject matter expert. And so you're not going, oh, let me put in my first name, last name, you know, and like get bombarded by, you know, some sort of uh, semi-automated spam sequence of follow-ups. Why mm -hmm. don't I just get directly booked to the meeting, you know, right from that time when I'm interested in that product and then in parallel, you know, inside your proposal deck or some other sales presentation, oftentimes people send those to have the meeting, right? Like it's, it's the whole point of sending that is like, hey, let's get ready to the next meeting. And so we think uh, tools like Calendly um, all have this, this additional ability of being integrated into other partner ecosystems. And, it, you know, I, I wonder what your take on that is like is, with this product like growth um, direction. I think what it's one of the channels for product that grows is being uh, integrated in other places where people work, right? So people work inside presentations, you know, we can put Calendly inside a presentation as an example. Do you have some views on that um, uh, channel and how important it is it for product led growth companies? And, and we'll come back as well to, to the, uh, uh, to the yeah, enterprise it's... topic. You know, I'm sure it's, it's a, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, it's something my colleagues and I think a lot about is the role of partner ecosystems in PLG. Uh, and to me, there's, uh, there's a huge overlap there, right? So for, if you think about, if you look back at the, at the market, part of why PLG is available now is because products are so seamlessly integrated. People are using other cloud-based software and then adding something else you know they're they're able to integrate relatively quickly share that data it makes the setup so much smoother and it means people don't have to be super technical in order to start seeing value from a new product so end users can adopt things that historically would have never been possible for an end user to adopt and uh, you know that's unlocked because of these partner ecosystems so for example i think that shopify marketplace is a great great kind of use case a small merchant might have a shopify store and then they want to go on the Shopify marketplace, they can add emailing, they can add chargeback automation, they can add SMS messages, and they just, you know, start to download that app. And then all of their kind of core Shopify information is passed through, and they can kind of get up and running relatively easily. No complex kind of IT implementation support, no dealing with an API or dealing with the developer to set things up. And so for me, these partner ecosystems are just super important because they allow you to both reach users where they already are. So end users can discover the products in their moment of need. And then the setup is super easy so they can get to their aha moment without a whole lot of effort. And then the products also tend to be stickier because people are, don't have to go log into yet another tool. Uh, they can access the product from the places where they already are. And so I think that that's very much the future, especially as folk, as cloud products are so ubiquitous in the enterprise. And so whether it's distributing through marketplaces or just having close partner relationships, uh, that's a huge direction for, for PLG. Great. Well, I, I think you've kind of highlighted one of the core differences in the approaches of the PLG, right? You're not, you don't have, no longer have a sales team. You don't have an army of you know, SDRs, BDRs, sales development reps, business development reps that are kind of a couple of years out of school reaching out and saying, hey, I'm going to share my expertise with you on topic A or B. So you kind of have, you bypass that because that's A, expensive, B, uh, doesn't really address the end user. Typically it's it's for, you know, maybe a, a buyer or persona of, of uh, some kind, still relevant again for some some products and decisions. But in the PLG world, so you've got this partner direction. Uh, but you know, the wh where else um, do you find uh, uh, the discoveries happening for the products, right? And and uh, you know, the role. Let's talk about the role of content, whether it's SEO uh, or you know, maybe building a community-driven content initiatives, right? Like let's talk about your newsletter as well. Like how. 
do you feel the content you know complements uh, the product led growth motion? Uh, and let's not say that it doesn't support the traditional enterprise motion because it still does. But like, let's focus on particular challenges around um, product led. Yeah, so it, when I think about PLG, right, you're marketing to users of your product, the people that are going to go log in, and yeah. try it themselves, and not just the executive buyers. And for users, you generally want to reach users in their moment of need. So as they're experiencing a pain point that uh, they could solve with your product. And when you market to users in their moment of need, the, you know, the channels that you start thinking about are like Google search, right? Because when someone has a need, they often turn to Google if like, I'm facing this problem. Is there a solution out there for it? Or just how do I fix my problem? Uh, and so you end up seeing kind of content and SEO oriented channels still working for PLG. Uh, I think particularly what's interesting is the more programmatic SEO opportunities uh, at the top of the funnel, which I can get into if, if you'd like. But then also what's interesting about kind of PLG businesses is if you reach this end user and they fall in love with your product, they're often willing to talk about it in communities mm. or online. Uh, that it's much, you know, you're going to be willing to talk about how much you love Calendly more so than how much you love Salesforce, right? <laughs> or that's the, that's the hope. Well, I love and, Salesforce, by the way, Fred from Salesforce, they're <laughs> one of our clients friends and like some of the really most amazing people um, that I've encountered professionally work there. So I love Salesforce. And I want to tell you that at the time when Salesforce was starting and I, I had the privilege of being there on the, you know, during the right before and during IPO as a you know useless um, MBA intern, but, but still kind of was a very fun journey. Um, uh, people forget it, but they were, they probably had the first um, PLG, solution was a free CRM for individual users. Uh, and so I think this is, you know, it was called freemium probably back then because you guys didn't invent the term yet and it wasn't a proven tactic. But I think obviously, it, you know, as strategies evolve, there's some changes uh, there. But uh, but I will agree with you that some of the products that you kind of, immediately, you know, you don't have to go through IT to buy, you kind of, you feel like you've discovered uh, Calendly, and you feel a certain sense of pride uh, that you've discovered this, found more efficiency in your day. I think you're more likely to talk about something like that. Totally. Because so there's like the end a, user. A product. Yeah. Right. Like the, the value proposition a lot of times is going to the end user versus just like the a more executive oriented product. It's more about solving a business need, driving ROI for the company. Yeah. Uh, and while obviously people are willing to pay for that, it's very important. It just is a little bit less viral, <laughs> or uh, or something that that individuals are less likely to shout from the rooftop. So PLG products, you're often get finding these power users who go want to talk about their experiences, and so they start to build a community around your product. And a lot of that happens organically without the company doing a whole lot. You obviously see this in developer oriented products, but it's even in horizontal PLG products like an Airtable, a Notion has a massive community. Figma has a massive community around, around designers. And so uh, this ends up being an interesting growth opportunity for PLG companies to tap into when they see signs of kind of a lot of organic love, organic social activity. How do we amplify that uh, in order to drive more growth for the business? Yeah, and so, um, I mean, I guess I would still probably challenge that this is, it's not like a Salesforce cannot organize a community. It's just a maybe slightly different direction of where the community takes, right? Like I've I've been privileged to be part of the Salesforce community. There are people that put to Salesforce on themselves, which I don't, I haven't seen Notion tattoos yet, or, or you know, maybe, maybe Figma, I could, have, I could see that. Uh, but the, and I think the community at Salesforce was, Maybe it was it did start from you know building an Ahana and there was like a lot more maybe deliberate approach to to really creating you know a special environment where people help each other out help each other find jobs you know um, I think Mark had um, an ethical way of thinking about how he would run the business and that informed a lot of the community drive so. Um, what I'm hearing is there's probably almost 
different types of communities, right? Like you could have this be very deliberate, maybe um, community where you bring people together through events and virtually and so on. And then there is this sort of, I love this product. I want to talk about this product, um, and, but I haven't like I haven't met the other people yet. They're just we share that we we all love this product. Is it, am I hearing like am I bridging the two worlds together, or how would you? I think start? it's. I don't think yeah, Notion does Dreamforce type of events or anything like that. Like yeah, you bring up a fair point. I think that the communities in like the Salesforce model tend to be higher touch, more event driven, in person driven, and you create connections. But it's also just a much higher cost type of right. program. And some of it is is actually organized more around like customer success and keeping customers engaged and being willing to serve as a reference or renewing. And so and like that's more of why companies have communities often at, at the Salesforce level versus communities driving like top of funnel acquisition as aggressively, which is more on the PLG side. Uh, Got it. Yeah, so it's, it's a, so a community that drives top of funnel. That's a good distinction, right? So now, I, now I'm with you. So that, that's a community where you shout out on Twitter, no X, or on uh, uh, LinkedIn. You're like, here, look at what AI I've created. Tools I've used to yeah. 10x my productivity. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah. here's my Notion board setup that I'm super proud yeah. of, and I'm gonna list it in their marketplace that you can go, you know, sign up for it and, and use my Notion setup. Or hey, here's the a plugin I just made. Uh, try it out. Like you get a lot more. Uh, you just get a lot more acquisition benefits, I think, from community. If your users that get it, you know, the users find value and then the users share that value and other people can go sign up and try it for themselves. It just creates more of a flywheel on the acquisition side. So I think that the distinction is share value within the community or share value kind of to the world that draws more people into the community is sort of a, a one way I'm, I'm thinking because like, again, we just interviewed um, CEO of Alteryx, uh, um, Dean Stoker, and I think they have also people name their children Alteryx. They kind of, it's a really strong sense of community. They share stories, they share, but but I do think it's a little bit more- There maternal. are people who name their children that? Alteryx, <laughs> yes. This is, I, this is a <laughs> test for me. I have uh, yet to uh, to have anybody name. I'd like uh, to count how many of those there are, but <laughs> but there there are there are it's uh, it works. Uh, so for us, it's uh, it's it's an interesting um, it's an I mean, the Harley. This is the classical story of Harley Davidson, right? Like people, uh, what what we've learned actually from another episode is that um, there are people that don't own Harley Davidson that get a tattoo of Harley Davidson. Right. And that's sort of the ultimate, I think, kind of uh, connection to a community and, and to a brand identity. Um, so. So anyway, um, what I do want to come back to to the topic of uh, the more technical SEO, we just had a guest, Godar Abel, who you you, you uh, know uh, really well, I'm sure. And Godar um, has um, um, has really sp spoken quite a lot about the value that um, uh, they've gotten from being very methodical and kind of creating categories, destinations uh, through SEO. And now uh, people, when they come, you're know, searching like alternative to product X, for example, which is a, a good signal of somebody with the pain kind of being late in market, they're going to land into a bunch of sponsored ads uh, which are expensive for people to do. And then the first organic entry is likely to be G2 after that, which will have a list of companies. And we love G2. I mean, we, we play the menu category. So for us, it's a really important way to kind of get um, featured without us, you know, um, to, doing a ton of SEO work ourselves. So we benefit from that. So guide us a little bit on, um, what are other things that you could be doing uh, from the SEO perspective that are obviously less more, more cost effective since PLG, you know, is kind of that's one of its big focus areas, and the pricing gets reduced a little bit to make it more affordable to try. So guide us in the lower cost of customer acquisition tactics that people are using, and if they're really yeah. lower cost or not. You know, maybe at the end, SEO is expensive to execute well. Well, and it's so if you think about the classic like SEO strategy that you know people have in the back of their minds, it's 
we're going to go look at the top X number of search results for a category that's related to my brand. And those are going to be really competitive, really hard to win. And so you're going to write super thoughtful content. You're going to go after getting backlinks for it. You're going to uh, really build a very high touch kind of or high investment content strategy to rank in the top 10 or whatever number it is keywords. In the more PLG oriented approach, it's a bit more of a programmatic play where you take a data source and you serve it up different ways to be able to be found across hundreds or thousands or even hundreds of thousands of long tail searches that collectively add up to even more traffic than the, than the top search terms. And so I think like the G2 example is they have data on all of these different categories of software, all the players in the categories. And so they also know, hey, if you're searching for Salesforce, as like you might be searching for alternatives to Salesforce. And so they can start to serve up all of their data in really interesting ways. And they're taking essentially the same data, but then serving it up in different types of landing pages so that it ranks based on the, the intent that the user has, right? Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. um, And so that allows them to go after hundreds or thousands of searches with the same underlying content pool. And so for a lot of PLG companies, they think about similar tactics, right? And, and so one approach would be to look at like a template marketplace or just some sort of marketplace where you could say, hey, look, our product, like let's look, let's take Miro, for example. Our product is a virtual whiteboarding tool but it's a virtual whiteboarding tool that can be used for mind maps and you know org charts and all of these other things. And so you can actually build out landing pages that cover all of these different templates. Uh, oftentimes PLG companies have those templates in their apps already for users to find value when they get started. And so it's this rich sort of set of data they can actually go be exposed to SEO with custom landing pages to then actually bring a lot of top of funnel acquisition around the things that users are searching for, right? Because a lot of users might not be, might not even realize they should have an online whiteboarding tool, but they do know that they want a mind map or they want something else that's uh, right. that's related to that tool. And and for for PLG companies, it, you have to look at where you have that that data and where you're going to be able to reach users based on the needs as they see it. And so it does take a lot of, of thought and even potentially some engineering work. Uh, but it's a, it's sort of a different way of thinking about content to reach a very mass market user user base. Yeah, and I think you bring up tools and we kind of, as a no-code platform, we really think a lot about what this Mirror doing or Airtable is doing. And I think for platforms that have maybe one core strength, like that's horizontally applied, this this is even a bigger challenge to some degree, right? And how do you uh, cover the, the the broad footprint of all the solutions they can you know provide, given the horizontality uh, and the, the kind of the flexibility of the of the tool? And um, I wonder what kind of challenges that brings later, right? When when these users do kind of discover a you know very niche inbound type of landing page, uh, they go in and then they land into a very uh, difficult to figure out platform um, that's maybe not even specific to that you know, use case anymore, right? Like maybe you, you use a template, you know, but but in general, like I think the perception from folks that we spoke with is that over time, these no code platforms go from really easy to use to building up more and more capabilities and become a bit more of a, of a hurdle to figure out um, than maybe the version one of Airtable. And so the question is like, what's what are the risks of this approach where you go and throwing a really wide net and you know, hoping it will kind of lead to success. Well, I, I mean, I'd argue it should, doesn't have to be that complicated. Like a Miro is quite large and still very easy to use product. Uh, to me, if someone is landing on a template and then they you are able to contextually surface up that same template in the app, 
you're basically creating a very usable product because someone's able to solve the pain point that they were hiring your product to help them solve and they can get that value immediately. And then the, the struggle is actually more around how do you educate them that your product can do more and how do you encourage them to bring on other users or, or find other use cases for your product beyond that initial one that brought them there. Uh, but like, yeah, I mean, if you look at like a Zapier, they have a similar programmatic strategy where someone might be thinking about, hey, how do I integrate HubSpot in Typeform? Or I've got a contact in Typeform I want to send to HubSpot. They'll have landing pages around that. And then you can go just build that thing, build that connection that you want really easily. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then the challenge becomes well, we have a lot of people that are using us for this one specific thing. How do we educate them that? It's not just about HubSpot and Typeform, but we can connect thousands of apps with thousands of apps for like millions of different potential use cases. And then it becomes more of that, of how do we take these initial users on a journey to do more and ultimately be ready to buy and then be ready to kind of get the enterprise on board. And that's why yeah. you see a lot of PLG and sales pairing because people will find their, their target customers land and maybe find value with like a pocket of what they can do. But then with the right kind of sales motion, they can expand that account to kind of understand the bigger picture. Got it. That's great. So this is one of the topics we would love to cover. So, so when you're doing a very simple kind of a specific use case, right? Or then, then it's, you have less people involved, probably less approvals necessary, you know, so it's sort of faster cycle. You sign up on a, some for some freemium journey, and so off you go. But then, as you mentioned, um, it sort of un leaves a lot of value on the table if you happen to be an employee in you know very large organization uh, that that you know that other folks could benefit from that offering. Um, and so the um, the traditional sales tactics may not work as well in that you know, it was those product led users, right? They're more junior. They may not be wanting to talk to a sales person or somebody with a sales title. You know, what do you see as best in class companies that are, that are bridging the product led land with a, um, was a more hybrid expansion uh, and sales strategy? What are they doing differently? Um, because yeah, it's a really it's a great, two different cultures and you know, mixing them doesn't seem to be obvious for most organizations. It's a great question. And then some of the early days, companies would, would over-index on these like product qualified leads, right? Hey, we've got a power user that's doing all of these things. Let's have sales reach out and try to sell them a bigger deal. And then, you know, you might find some needles in the haystack there, convert some customers to bigger deals, but ultimately that strategy doesn't really work that well uh, because the user is not the executive buyer. They don't know how to advocate internally for a bigger deal. The value propositions are different at the end user level versus at the enterprise or the executive level. And so the sales motion, just it, it's not about like calling on your existing product users to sell them something more. Uh, generally, what, what you need to do is, is think, uh, uh, think a little bit differently. So the, in my mind, the best companies will, will start off by having really good data foundation. So when mm -hmm. a user signs up, they're looking not just at that user, but at the account. Is this, a, is this an account that's in our ideal customer profile based on the size of the company, the industry that they're in, and so on? And how many other users in this account do we have that are already on the, on the product? Ideally, you have multiple, but you, you, know, you might start with the first one, obviously. And then what's the usage activity in that account? And does it signal that they're kind of showing signs of high value use cases or being ready to buy? And so you look at that data to create what, what we call a product qualified account. And that product qualified account should then have users within it. And you can, you know, best companies will even be able to stack rank the users based on both usage activity and based on seniority. And so then for a sales rep, they have visibility into the account is interesting for them and they know who they can reach out to at that account. And then there's a lot of like navigating the account. It looks more like an account manager type of role where you navigate expansion with an existing customer rather than a traditional AE role, even if you're working with a free free account. And so you, you wanna maybe start with the users and especially the power users, just document how they use the product 
what it does for them, what the business priorities are, right? You started to use them for fact finding and you can ask them for an introduction to their boss or you can enable them with materials to go to bat for you, right? But you often are using them more for that fa initial fact finding. And then you might need to go top down, right? Reach out to a decision maker with data or with a more personalized, personalized note and really kind of work that account cohesively and that's a totally different strategy from working with a you know net new prospect that's never heard of your brand where you're trying to get that you know demo in front of them now it's you know there's people that use their product that love your product and so you want to bring in data and personalization to say hey based on other companies like you here's what else you could do that will add even more value and you kind of navigate in partnership with the users who are advocating for you in order to get to that kind of shared destination. Got it. So you're fundamentally saying you're you're selling to an account that is already technically a customer. So you have a little bit more trust and credibility and evidence of your solution's efficacy. But since those product-led uh, users or champions may not be that powerful or that high up in the organization, you know, you may still at times go and do the more traditional top-down uh, approach and outreach. But in this case, you're going to have more, uh, more of a reason and more value to add in that approach, right? And, and, and do you ever see um, the top-down, like, like some sort of a dual combo where you'd say, hey, this is a target account. We're going to go approach the top folks, but in parallel, we'll kind of drive some SEM strategy or, you know, Facebook ad strategy to get this in front of bottom up users. And so like some, some extreme ABM almost approach. And, and I bring it up because like a, a platform like ours, we actually started was, was, you know, first customers were I would say teams, but they were a little bit top down uh, approach. We would kind of meet with a team person. They weren't users before. We would explain to them, you know, the value of the solution, and then they would sort of start using it, et cetera. And, and we really, you know, learned from that experience. And we'll, we'll come back to that, that, you know, hey, having a great product that's strong enough to stand on its own legs as a PLG motion will inevitably help us spread inside an enterprise especially if you're selling to teams, right? Not to the very, very high end of organization, but like a, a team solution. So we, we've we like became believers in the, in the PLG and we almost want to hold ourselves intellectually honest, like how good is our product without us, you know, touching it that much, right? And, and will we get champions? And I think um, my, my sense is there's quite a few companies like that, that have sort of this, you know, identified you'll, ICPs that are, you know, and then they want to start doing some things top down and they may even have momentum and then the deal gets stuck. And then like, how do you get it unstuck? And one of the strategies is like, let's get some bottom up usage. Let's get teams. Let's get like, we had a conversation, they buy in, but you know, we can add a little bit more umph uh, through, through just momentum on the, on where, we, you know, it's easier for us to administer that. Have you seen, Companies that sort of bridge the top down and bottom up do more of that, you know, combination play. Yeah, there's definitely some creative approaches out there. I mean, I tend to see it as uh, actually like you have existing product users in an account that you're targeting, right? That account is owned by a sales rep. And marketing is actually responsible for doing ABM style email and uh, other can other uh, advertising in order to get intent from the buyer. And so you often have like some sort of shared ownership of these accounts. Uh, and I mean, the benefit is there's generally the accounts you're qualifying have some sort of product usage or product intent. And then uh, you want to get to that decision maker and you can get there in a number of ways. And the more automation and kind of scalable tactics you can use, the, the easier it is to, to run these kinds of plays rather than just relying on sales to go kind of break into and navigate the entire account one by one. But yeah, I mean, a, a Figma, for example, is probably a good example. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote about 
some of their growth marketing efforts in Growth Unhinged, my, my newsletter. But yeah, this is exactly the kind of approach that many PLG companies take because they they know the revenue comes from enterprise deals and larger accounts. And that might happen you know, with enough time by starting with that end user and, and on a self-service basis and having those users advocate uh, and kind of get to bigger and bigger deals over time. But most in most cases, you either want to accelerate that process or help kind of add more air coverage uh, in order to uh, work that account and 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 get to that decision maker faster. Got it. So so let's so you brought up marketing and and I think we haven't spoken about marketing, but you yourself, Kyle, like you're uh, you know a powerhouse of marketing, open view and all the good research and work you guys are doing. On PLG, you've done this before with the pricing, and you kind of you were you know a, um, a director at, at the leading pricing consulting firm you know pr previously. So tell us a little bit about kind of using thought leadership and education to to establish a brand and establish a pipeline. I, I'm assuming of folks that kind of love to talk to to you guys because you've forgotten more about PLG than most people will ever know, right? And like, and you know, I'm really curious, you know, how you think about this in your business as OpenView. Yeah, well, maybe I'll start on the personal side and then I'll kind of pivot on the OpenView side. So on the personal side, really the impetus is like my, in my role, I work with portfolio companies to help them accelerate their growth, right. Or uh, overcome roadblocks that are getting in the way of growth. And I get a lot of questions from founders and we really do kind of in-depth work with them, but also answer ad hoc emails. And so what happened time and again is like, I put a lot of work into, into you know, uh, answering a certain problem or helping a company unlock a, ch a challenge. And then, move on to the next thing, right? And I realized, well, it, it might be interesting to kind of open source some of the learnings here, share mm -hmm. those out in a blog post or on LinkedIn, uh, and then, you know, also get get feedback from, from other people on it, see if I missed anything, um, mm -hmm. and start to kind of build a community around those ideas. And so I just started kind of more regularly writing about the, the challenges that I was working with our portfolio companies on and sharing that on social media, particularly on LinkedIn. And then often that would actually just make me better at my job uh, mm -hmm. and help me understand what was top of mind to even more founders, right? So, so I would figure out what's resonating. Maybe I test something on LinkedIn it resonated. I decided to write an entire blog post about that. I'd share that back on LinkedIn. Other founders in our portfolio would see that as well. And they would ask me other questions related to it. And it sort of would become this sort of flywheel that built on itself. And I really saw, I mean, a lot of people go, I don't have time to write content and do my job. For me, content actually helps me get better at doing my job. Uh, and has helped me attract uh, not only like an audience of people, but build a network of like-minded folks that uh, have different experiences than I do, uh, hone my problem-solving skills and, and set of experiences, and just uh, really become a much more effective. And so that's how I started in content. Mm -hmm. And I started with air subject matter subject, subject matters that I had more personal experience in but over time got more confident going into and exploring other topics that were important to our portfolio companies, but were not areas that I worked on in the past. Uh, and so that's that's been really you know amazing for me from a pro professional standpoint, but how that feeds into OpenView. So initially it was more actually just helping support me in doing my job and being more effective with our portfolio companies. But now I actually oversee marketing at OpenView. That's a change that happened about a year ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And and the uh, so now it you know with my marketing hat on, in, in my mind what we want to do as a firm is we want founders ahead of you know raising the uh, venture funding in the rounds that we invest in, we want them to think about us and, and not just know that we're a VC firm, but think of us as something as someone that can genuinely help them grow their business, so that if someone on our investment team, for example, reaches out to them. Uh, they're like, oh, that's great. 
I already know you guys. I've, you know, I know your portfolio. I know, you know, how, what you focus on and how you can be helpful. And, you know, best case scenario. By the way, this is exactly what happened to us, to. Kyle. One of your, one of your folks <laughs> reached out to us. I'm like, oh, I, I've been, uh, I've been a fan. And, uh, and so, you know, instead of a kind of conversation that sort of is like, tell us how much money you're making in ARR, where, you know, we can have a much more meaningful conversation uh, right now. So it's really working. I think I applaud your strategy because I think as a founder, you know, I, I, I definitely, you know, kept top of your mind, your content, Blake's uh, as well. And so it's, uh, you know, keep up the good work. I think, uh, yeah, I think awesome. it's, the strategy is working. Glad to hear it. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. But you know, where, we're, where we're going, that is genuinely hard, but uh, I think is worth it, is more of an ABM style approach. There's a known mm -hmm. universe of software companies in the stages that we invested. And there's, you know, relatively small number of people that are founders at those companies, right? We're not talking about millions of people. We're talking about tens of thousands, maybe. And so uh, for us, we can we have kind of embarked on much more of a direct or ABM style approach to mm -hmm. identify these companies and the founders at them, make sure that we're measuring success, not based on page views of maybe a report that we've downloaded, but on engagement from that target audience mm -hmm. and look at it how we drive engagement with that audience, what they end up care caring about and what resonates with them. Uh, and then how can we sort of nurture them to show signals that we haven't just reached them from an awareness standpoint, but we've developed kind of strong affiliation or maybe they're even champions of what we're doing before we've ever talked to them. And so we actually try to take them on a very content oriented marketing journey, uh, but where we're looking at that engagement level within a target audience rather than more traditional SaaS kind of marketing metrics. So this is fantastic. So I, th I think there's a misperception that content is all about SEO, right? And I think when I, if you look like we were debating, you know, what to call ourselves, like is it content like growth kind of is that, by the way, you know, <laughs> stealing, stealing some ideas that we like. Uh, and because content can be used in sales, it can be used in marketing, it, you know, it, but, but ironically, when, if you kind of, you know, most people, when you say content like gross, they think, you know, I just, you know, I own, I, I publish a bunch of blog posts, right. And those are yep. generating. And we think that's really a very narrow way of thinking about content, right. Because there is, yes, there's awareness content and finding you at the moment of need, but then for, for, folks like yourself, you actually want deeper engagement with these founders, right? Like you, you, you know, it's great if they find an occasional post on something topical, but if they go deep inside your, you know, depth, you know, more in-depth analysis and they, they kind of, wow, this is exactly the journey that I need to go on. These are exactly the tools. So you build a lot more trust, I think, through this deeper um, content. And so that may fuel into ABM type of strategy or very, you know, very specific, um, you know, offerings that are, that, that allow you to go deeper with that audience that you're targeting. That is not, you know, traditional SEO that may actually fit into an ebook or some other, or, or like in-depth video series of some kind. Right. So, so, so I, I, I kind of applaud. Yeah. And actually thinking. for, for yeah. us, some of the SEO efforts in our prior days have actually backfired, right? Because we've had blog posts that have done super well in SEO, but looking back, one was like, you know, how to write a daily report to your SDR manager. Somehow that was one of our like top five SEO oriented posts for a while. And the marketing team, you know, if it was, or if it was measured based on traffic would feel the need to regularly refresh that post, add to it, keep it up to date, maybe create a pillar page out of content like that. But that's not, what a founder cares about, right? We actually yeah. even had an internship oriented post that was in our top five. It just, uh, there there can be misaligned goals, right? Where, where if you're oriented around these top of funnel kind of classic marketing metrics, you don't actually end up driving influence with the people that matter in your target audience. And so for us, we do things like, you know, direct email automation for high value content, 
We'll do LinkedIn retargeting within specific audiences uh, that we do a lot of data enrichment to personalize uh, direct mail or direct email so that we send the right content to the right types of founders based on what we know about them. We look for influencer partnerships of other people who have relationships with that founder audience that we care about. So that could be early stage VCs where we can co-partner with them or uh, do events with them to get in front of kind of similar founders. Uh, we do kind of local marketing tactics around some of the geos that have a high concentration of founders in this audience. So the, the marketing tactics, it is content ends up being the fuel for all of those efforts, right? We need really high value content and thought leadership to really resonate with founders. But then our engine is about getting that fuel in front, uh, in front or of using that fuel to get in front of the right audience at the right time. Great. Well, let's let's uh, share with our audience how they can get in front of that fuel of amazing content that you've uh, you've put together, and what are the channels where they can find you, Kyle? Well, uh, I, so LinkedIn. Uh, follow me on LinkedIn. I write probably three to four posts a week. I'm pretty prolific on LinkedIn. And then uh, you can subscribe to the OpenView newsletter uh, by just going to our website, which is uh, ov.vc, it's relatively easy. And then my personal newsletter is called Growth on Hinge and it's on Substack. Amazing. Kyle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for building uh, great insights around the, the the topics that we've addressed uh, from PLG and PLG fueled sales. Uh, really pound for pound, very interesting discussion. And uh, I hope uh, the world starts following your thought leadership on these topics and that of OpenView. Thank you again. Thanks, Alex.